We are The Table, and we are so glad that you have taken time out of your week to join us. Here at The Table, it is our hope to move you forward in life and faith over the course of this message. At The Table, we do things just a bit differently. We pose questions in real time, and we want to give you some time to wrestle with those questions as well. Again, thanks for joining us, and we hope that this message moves you forward. Hey, this morning, I want you to stand with me. Can you stand with me? I know it's kind of, I know you're getting relaxed on me. I don't want you to relax today. I want you to be excited about where we're headed and what we're doing. Um, Man, I want to prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our lives. Your work lives, your student lives, your parenting lives, your kids' lives, your neighbors' lives, your broken lives, like every area of your life, God is interested in working. And one of the ways he does that is through his word. I love this. Um, Our life group, just a side note, uh, our life group met this week. And this is a shameless plug. I do not care. If you are not in a life group, you need to get in one. You need to sign up for one before you leave or just say, I want to lead one. We would love for you to lead one. But this week, somebody in our life group shared, they said, after last week's message where we said, The future is bright when me becomes we. I went home and I prayed that God would teach me to love my neighborhood. It's powerful. God wants to to transform every area of our lives. And so this morning, can we celebrate? Can we celebrate that God wants to speak to us through his word this morning? Here's what he says. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. God has called you to a free life. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by that yoke of slavery. Verse 7 says, hey, you are running a good race, but I want to know who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Hey, a little yeast will work its way through the whole batch of dough. And he says, I am confident, I am confident that in the Lord you will take no other view. Today, uh, today's message is entitled, Freedom for Now. Freedom for right now. So, you ready for today? Put on your thinking caps. Get your excitement going because... It's going to be a fun ride ride today. So on your way down, turn to your partner and tell them the longest distance you've ever run in your life. There you go. The longest distance you've ever run in your life. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. All right. Here we go, are you ready? I wanna start with this question this morning. Hey, listen, I know you haven't run that long, come on. (laughs) That was a joke, here we go, here we go. I wanna start with the question this morning and it's this. What defines a good race? What defines a good race? So I wanna play a game this morning. Can we play a game together? I like games, I hope you like games. Uh, We'll just have a little fun here. Here's how we play. I'm going to put up a picture on the screen, and uh, if you think it is a good race, I want you to raise your right hand, okay? Are you with me? If you don't know your right hand, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. If you think it is a bad race, in your opinion, it's a bad race, I want you to raise your left foot. That's right. You thought I was going to say hand. If you don't know your right hand from your left foot, then we'll do this. Uh, Raise your right hand if you think it's a good race and yell, good race. All right. If you think it's a a bad race, you raise your left foot. Or if you don't want to do that, you can go like this and say, bad race. I got to be able to tell the difference between the two. So are you ready for this? Any confusion about what we're doing? Okay, good. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, All right, here we go. First picture. Let's see what we got. The person... 
who is in the back? Good race or bad race? What do you got? Good race or bad race? I only see a few hands. Does that mean that everybody else has their left foot up? Good race, bad race. All right, here we go, second race. The person who finishes way ahead. Good race or bad race? All right, good race, all right. Some of you are choosing not to participate today. We'll give you an F. No, I'm just kidding. All right, next one. Let's do this next one. Neck and neck. Good race or a bad race? Good race. Okay. All right. Uh, too close to call. The next one. Here we go. Too close to call. Everyone ties. Good race. Bad race. All right. All right. Uh, how about this guy? running a marathon on a treadmill. Good race or a bad race? Huh? All right, you guys weren't so sure about the last one. Here's my thought. Hey, I'm gonna need you guys to pipe down for a minute, please. I'm trying to get through this. Here's where I'm going, right? You guys have helped me out tremendously today, and here's what I've learned, is that the perspective of the viewer is always subjective. The per perspective of the viewer is always subjective. So can there be any objective truth in a race? And if so, what anchors a good race? And so that only leaves one plausible solution left, which is, which is the runner. Think about this with me for a minute, right? Uh, a runner, we watched the Olympics, 2020 Olympics in 2021. Anybody else think that was weird? I did. I thought it back to the future or future to the back or whatever you want to call it. It's a little bit odd, but, but interestingly, after every race, they interview the people who are in the race. And do you notice what happens? The person who is in first, they'll, they'll interview and they say, how did you feel about your performance today? And they'll say, well, I wasn't really happy with it. I, I could have done better. And you're like, you won the race. What more do you want? Or sometimes the people who come in second and third, um, they'll say, how did you feel about your performance today? And they're like, I, was, I felt really good about how I did today. And it's like, you've got to be lying. Because you did not get to the Olympics by coming second and third all the time. Right? No, you, you won every race, but you're telling me you feel, you feel good about coming in second. Sometimes they interview the people who are in last, that one person on the screen. How would you feel about your race? And they say, it was a good race for me. Because I had a PR, right? You see, sometimes um, we have to understand that, that the race always comes down to how confident the runner feels. It doesn't matter if they're first, they're last, they're the underdog, they come on top. It always comes down to confidence. And so I need you to understand this today because it's so important that a good race starts and finishes with confidence. A good race always starts and finishes with confidence. A um, little story here. The other day, I was talking to Miles um, about how to handle himself on the soccer pitch. Now, I didn't play soccer growing up, so why would I be giving my kid advice? You know, that's what you're probably thinking. But as I told you, we've kind of moved leagues, we've moved on, and the kids are really skilled, and our kids are still working their way into the program. And, and I noticed that during, during the, 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 the soccer match, um, when we first started out, Miles would do this. The ball would go this way, and he'd go. And then the ball would go that way, and he'd go. And so before you know it, pretty much the whole match, he's just skipping down the whole field. Woo! You know, and I'm like, I've seen you play soccer before. Who in the world is this guy? And so Miles gets done after the game, and he says, Dad, how, how do you think I did? And I said, horrible. No, I didn't say that. I'm just kidding. I would never say that to him. I said, oh, you had a good game, man. I said, tell me, um, you, you look a little bit timid out there. Are you afraid? He said, yeah, I'm afraid. So what are you afraid of? He said, I'm afraid of, of making a mistake. I said, can I tell you a little story, son? I once had an employee who, who was so afraid 
of making the wrong decision, do you know what they did? He said, I don't know. I said, they did nothing. They were so afraid of making the wrong decision or leading things in the, the right direction or the wrong direction, they were so afraid to make a choice that they did nothing. And I said, if, if you constantly play soccer afraid, right, do you know what you're going to do? And he said, I think, I think I'm tracking. I'm going to skip. And he didn't say that. He said, I'm going I'm to do nothing. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? I said, yeah, see, see, here's the thing, son. It doesn't matter if you're good enough. It doesn't matter if you're the best player on the field. The only thing that will, that will make a difference in your play is your confidence. It's your confidence. You see, a good race always starts and finishes with confidence. And so I want to ask you this, this question this morning. How are you feeling? How confident are you today in your race? How confident are you today in the race that you're running? Are, are you confident in your identity? Are you, are you confident when you step onto the job every single day? Are you confident in the way that you, you parent your kids? Are you confident in the friendships that you're making? Are you confident with the people that are around you? Are you confident in your body? Can, can I ask some more personal questions this morning? Are, are you confident in your faith? Are, are you confident in God? Are you confident that, that Jesus says who he says that he is? Are you confident that Jesus can give you the confidence you need in the life that you're currently living, in the race that you're supposed to be running. You see, see, I think we lose what Paul's talking about this morning. Can I just say Paul put me to sleep when I first read this? Is that okay? Can I, can, I'm not that holy. Can I just say that? Like when Paul wrote, he says this, he says, you were running the good race, but I want to know who cut in on you to keep you from, check this out, obeying the truth. Now, if you want to lose me at any point, just use the words obedience and truth, right? Because when, when, when I was growing up, somebody told me to do something, I would just do the opposite of what they told me to do. There's something fun about being rebellious. And so when Paul says, um, uh, here's the thing, I want you to obey the truth, right? I'm like, this, Paul, this isn't working for me. I'm not motivated by obedience, and so because I wasn't motivated, I'm sh I was just thinking, I don't think this is what Paul really meant by that. So let's really find what Paul meant behind what he was saying, because this isn't working for me. And so I begin to do a little bit of research. And what's so cool is that I turned out I was right. Paul actually uses a different word here. And the word is this, it's, it's confident. The word for obedience is confidence. And so, I love this, a better way of saying it is a good race, according to Paul, is that we are confident in the truth. Let me just say this. Um, what he's saying is, this is not a subjective perspective. You see, if it's, if it's got to be truth, then it has to be truth for everyone. And here's the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And some of us get offended when we hear that, but what Jesus is saying is, I'm not calling you to a religion, I'm calling you to a different kind of world that calls you to be free. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I'm not calling you to a religion, I'm calling you to a different reality. And so what he's saying is, for everyone, for everyone, for everyone, I am calling you to live free. Paul says it. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. You see what Jesus has done on the cross, whether you accept it or not, is that it is for you. It was meant to unchain you. It was meant to break down the chains that hold you. It was meant to uplift you, and God is calling you to a better race instead of the rat race. I'm excited today. I'm just going to preach. Is that okay? Is that okay? And I love this because Jesus says, hey, who the Son sets free, they are free indeed. 
And I've been wrestling with this idea of live free since sabbatical. When you guys gifted me 10 weeks off, the first thing that I asked God was, what is it that you want to say to me? And so I went on a run on a Sunday, and I skipped church. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I said, God, what do you want to say to me? And the first thing he said was, I need you to live free. I need you to live free. You see, I know that Jesus died for me. I know that the resurrection, when he comes back to life, and it's such a funny word, I don't, you know, I don't know why we couldn't come up with a better one, but it's like, I know these things. But he said, yeah, but what you don't know is that you were called to live a free life. You, you don't know what it means to be free in your life right now. And so I just want you to know that Jesus' entire intent for you and for me is that we would live free that we would live free, that you would begin to find your stride, that you would be confident in the race that you're running. And I just need you to know this. This is the vision for today, is that a good race starts and finishes with the idea that Jesus has set you free. That's it. That's it. We said last week, the only thing God has called you to experience in your life is for you to be free. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Uh, if you're new to the table, if it's your first time, we love to ask questions in the middle of the message. And, and we don't want this to be weird, but let me explain the why on why we do this. So in education world, they have found that the worst way to teach people is by doing what we do every Sunday. Lecturing people. The worst way to teach people in a classroom is lecturing people. And yet, go to college. What do they do? Mm -hmm. They lecture you. And so we find that the brain actually develops and works and grows and, and understands and comprehends when, when we do more than just lecture and teach and preach. And so one of the things we like to do is ask you questions. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to somebody next to you, that's cool, pull out your phone. Text yourself the answer to this question. I love that. I love getting texts for myself. You ever do that? Because you don't get enough anyway. So text yourself this question, write it down, or talk to somebody next to you. Here's the question. What is your source of truth? What is your source of truth? And the next question is, what does it build? What does it build? Does it build Freedom or fear? Does your source of truth build worry or joy? Does your source of truth build anxiety or grace? Take a couple minutes, think about it, text yourself, and then I wanna address a problem that, that Paul points out for each of us today. All right, take a couple minutes. All right, so we've established right up front that a good race starts and finishes with confidence that Christ has set us free. But, but I want you to, to, to notice with me what Paul is saying to this church that he's writing to in ver verse 7. He says, Hey, you were running a good race. Uh, notice he says, he doesn't say you are. He says, you were running a good race. But I, I want to know who cut in on you to keep you from being confident in the truth. And then he says this in verse 8, and I don't have it up here. Forgive me. He says, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Uh, this is so key. Uh, your confidence, your confidence in life is always cut off by persuading perspectives. Your confidence in life is being cut off by persuading perspectives. Can I say that? That's pretty daring, isn't it? Let's, let, me, let me unpack this for a minute. You see, the problem is, is that Paul is writing 
to a group of people who started a church, who were following Jesus, who were excited about the movement that was taking place, and go figure, leave it up to the religious leaders and the pastors and the priests to screw it all up. Come on, guys, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> so these people are, are confident in their faith. But then these religious leaders show up, and if you remember last week, uh, we were carrying a dumbbell around that carried, like, re represented circumcision, and they're saying, if you really want to be part of this faith community, if you really want to be part of this movement, this is the way to make it in. And, and what they were saying was, uh, my truth is your truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way. That is no longer the way. I have already fulfilled that way. And so the only way to truth is through me. And yet the religious leaders show up and they're saying, hey, I just want you to know, my truth is your truth, and if you want to get into this community, this is the way you do it. You see, they were persuading people to some, something that wasn't actually called by Jesus. See, confidence, confidence is cut off by persuading perspectives. Let me, let me, let me give you a, a real life example. Let's talk about dieting for a minute, can we? You see, how often does a new diet come out? Every day, you've got the paleo diet, you've got the vegan diet, you've got the whole foods diet, you've got whatever diet is out there. And what's, what's crazy is you will meet people who lose tons of weight, right? And the first thing you say is, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? And they'll say, well, I was following this diet because it's 90% diet. And, and what happens is, is they will say to you, like, this is how I did it. You should try it out, right? There's a, there's a little bit of persuasion. It worked for me. It's probably going to work for you. And so they're kind of drawing you in because of the weight loss. And, and I, can I just say this? If, if your diet plan has the word diet, it's not a good plan. It's just not. Like, uh, I like to think of it as a lifestyle, as an identity. If you need something on creating new habits, wonderful book called Atomic Habits, it talks about this. But what happens is we are easily persuaded by people's perspectives on dieting, and then we find out, well, that didn't work for me. Why is that? You see, everybody's body is different. Everybody responds to food differently. Things that are good for me, probably not good for you. Things that are good for you, probably not good for me. It's not the same for everybody. And yet, this is the experience of our culture, right? That my perspective, my persuasion to my perspective, persuading you into my perspective is the way we live right now. If you don't see it my way, then hit the highway. Come on, I'll just say this. Uh, this is a leap, but the reason why we live in worry, the reason why so many of us have fear in our lives, the reason why, why you have anxiety, the reason why it constantly feels like you're not free is because nobody knows who's telling the truth anymore. We are searching for truth in all these different places and we go to the news and we go to our friends and we go to this person and that person and all they're doing is persuading you. And my question is, hey, who caught in on you? Who cut you off? Why are you no longer running the good race? Whose persuasion are you buying into that isn't truth at all? It's just their truth. You see, man, it sounds like the kids are having a great time back there. <laughs> can, can I just, will you allow me to just riff for a second? Is that okay? On this idea of persuasion? Yes. I am just as guilty. Like, I, I think I'm easy, easily persuadable. My wife would tell you I'm as stubborn as a goat. Are, are goats stubborn? A donkey. There we go. Donkey. There we go. Goats are stubborn too. But, but the other day we were, we were discussing our new schedules. 
right? We were discussing our new schedules, and, and the problem with our schedule is that a lot of our kids' soccer games now take place on the weekends. And what's crazy is uh, typically they're on Sundays at 10 a.m., or they're at like 9 a.m., or they're at 11 a.m. Now, I don't know if you know this, but uh, our church meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. And I have been told once or twice that I am the pastor here. On occasion, yeah. But what was so interesting was I'm looking through the schedule. And uh, I'm telling Janelle, like, we, we can make this work. We, we can make this work. You, you see, I'm hearing parents, like, in the bleachers during practice. And it's like, man, you got to be all committed in this league. Uh, uh, soccer's a religion for us. It's not just, like, something we do for fun. It's a religion. The coaches sending out percentages of how much our kids have been at practice. I was like, whoa, you talk about subversive leadership. Like, you need a lesson on leadership. And so I'm looking at the percentages, and my kids got an F. <laughs> so I'm like, I look at Janelle, I'm like, hey, we, we need to make, make this work. Like, you're just going to have to skip, skip church on Sunday. This is your pastor, okay? I'm, I'm <laughs> fallible. You're, gonna have to, you're, you're not going to serve in kids anymore. You're going to take the kids to their games. And she looks at me, she says, what is the end game? What, what's the end game in this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. They're, she's like, they're not going to play professional soccer. Sorry, buddy. You may someday. <laughs> He's not paying attention. He's filming me. But what's funny is I said, well, maybe we should stop fighting about it, and we should just ask our kids. So uh, Carter and I got in the car. And I said, hey, buddy, I want you to know, uh, mom and I can't agree on something. And so I just want you to know that you have games on Friday, you have games on Sundays. Uh, unfortunately, the games on Sundays uh, are during church time. So whatever you would like to do, you make the decision, we'll make it work for you. And he said, Dad, um, I think I should go to church. I said, are you saying that because I'm the pastor and you know that's what I want to hear? Or are you just saying that because you believe it? He said, no, I, th I, think, I think my faith is probably more important. Yeah, good, yeah give, him a, give him a high five. And I mean, here's the thing. Your pastor, being persuaded by people outside this community, to live my life, my wife, and everything else outside of this community, outside of the church, because it's not important anymore. Let me just say this. Part of the reason why people lack confidence is because they have bought into the lie that they no longer leave, they no longer believe they need to be part of a believing community. Part of the reason why people aren't confident in their faith is because they think, I don't have to go to church. They think, we should just make it work. <laughs> we don't need to show up on Sundays. We'll just make it work. And I'll just say this. Show me somebody who is so arrogant and so prideful to believe that they can do faith alone and they don't need other people in their lives, and I will show you a faith that's failing. Show me a person who thinks that they can do it on their own, and I will show you a faith that is blown this way and that way. Show me a person who says, I, I don't need to be part of this. Then I'm going to show you a faith that is swayed by your own politics. It is swayed by your own fear. It is swayed by your own worry. It is swayed by your own anxiety. And you know what I know? You're not free. You're not free. We said last week, if it's all about me, it's probably not free. If you can do faith alone, it's probably not freeing to you. You see, your faith is being cut in on by other people's perspectives. It's being cut in on by other people's truth. And the truth and the lie is that you just don't need this. And I'll just say this. I believe that the church is God's tool to help us to be confident in the times we need it the most. You see, every Sunday we gather, and the reason why we are here is to be reminded that not only did Jesus die for you, but he calls you to a new reality, a new life, a new experience, and because of that, you should live every single day with confidence. With confidence. 
see, y'all looking at me, but you don't look very confident. Some of y'all look like you're about ready to fall asleep. You don't look very confident. But God is, I'm just, I have so, I got to say this. If you want to finish the race well, if you want to start and finish the race, it has to be done with the confidence that Jesus has set you free. There is no other perspective that can persuade you from a different truth. Look at that. I knocked my building over. Let me end here. Paul says this. He says, I'm confident that you will take no other view. Is, is your faith, is Jesus the only view that you see when you wake up in the morning? Or is it your phone? Is your faith and Jesus, the thing that you see when you get up, or is it the news? Is your faith and Jesus the thing that you see when you get up every morning, or is it Facebook? Or is it a text message? I love this. He says, do not let them, do not be burdened by this yoke of slavery anymore. But he says, I need you to stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by slavery. So let me just say this. How do we find freedom for right now? The way that you find freedom in this moment is by standing firm. And we stand firm by establishing what I call anchors. There's a, there's a big difference here. You see, most of us, we establish our faith by building blocks. My little Jenga thing got messed up here. Let's do this. You see, most of us think that we need to have a foundation. We need to have... We need to, to, to build block. This is, this is my Bible reading time. This is my prayer time. This is, this is my theology and what I believe about God. And this is what I do every Sunday. And, and this is... You know, the, these are all the little things that we build as we go along in our lives. And what happens is, is people persuade you to their perspective. Hey, Brad, you know, you really don't need to take your kids to church. In fact, just let, I can't, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but just let Janelle take the boys' soccer. And it's not working, but faith, moment by moment, when we have these things that move in on our lives, oh, you don't, you don't need prayer life. It's not working today. But you get the point. You don't need your prayer life. You don't need your church life. Oh, you have the wrong theology about that. Let's just take that out. And all of a sudden, we wonder why we no longer have faith anymore. It's because you were building your faith on blocks and not anchors. Stand firm is about establishing anchors. Let me, let me give you a different point of view. Let's pretend that this is a boat rope. I told you I write all of my messages in my basement where my gym is, so this is the only thing that I have. But let's pretend like this is a boat rope, and this table is an anchor. You see, watch this. You ever, you ever seen a boat in a storm in a hurricane? Right, what happens? You have the anchor down, and it could be blown this way. It can go this way, and sometimes it gets too far out, and then it pulls it back in, right? We go this way. Oh, man, the wind is blowing. The waves are 40 foot high. It's not all the way anchored here. <laughs> but here's what I know. Standing firm is about having those points in your life that always draw you back. You see, when, when you get too far away and, and, and you believe things that maybe you're not really sure are true and we happen to buy into them and we find out, wow, that really didn't work for me, we always have this anchor and the anchor is that, that Christ has set you free and we get to come back to that. You see, when, when you go back into the addiction that you said you wouldn't go back into, hey, that's okay. You can swing any way which you want, but the truth is is that you have this anchor, once again, that says Christ 
is pulling you in to remind you that he has set you free. The anchor that allows you to stand firm is that Christ has set you free. And so when you can't figure out where you are in your life with your job, you're questioning your identity, and you keep going this way and that way, and you're not which, sure which way you should go, I just want you to know that when you get too far, you are drawn back in because Christ has set you free. This is the anchor of your life. It's the anchor of your life. And you need to establish this as one anchor that is true. Because it's the thing that will allow you to run a good race. You see, a good race starts and finishes with confidence that Christ has set you free. Can I pray for you this morning? God, we are grateful for the time together. Uh, this morning, I, I just want to pray over these amazing people here today for their time, their attention, their willingness to be here and to be part of this party that we, we get to celebrate the work that you're doing. God, I pray for the person in this moment right now who feels like life is not free. God, I would, would ask that you would begin to move in their life in a way that they would begin to see the truth that, man, you love them, you have called them, and you are asking them to experience a new reality in this world. That freedom is at the front door. Freedom is what you are calling them to. The weight, the brokenness, the heaviness, the things that we feel in our lives that seem to keep us down that we can't get away from. God, I just want, I just want you to speak into that moment, that thing in their life that, that keeps them from, from feeling light and joy and excitement. And so we pray this prayer this morning. God, today I give you my life. I give you all of me because you've called me to be free. And I ask that you lead all of me so that I can follow you wherever you take me. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. Amen. If this message challenged you and moved you forward, personally or in faith, we encourage you to share it with someone who needs a message of hope today. And if you're interested or looking for ways to partner with us in our mission here at The Table, head on over to thetablejoliet.org for more information.